All righty. Let's get this show on the road, folks. This one is an interesting one that I have for you guys tonight. I have not actually seen this one yet. I don't know. I, I've got a thing where if I do like reviews on videos, obviously not all the time because some of them I see and it's like really dumb and I need to review it. And then some of them I haven't seen and I want to, you know, I, I want sort of that raw reaction that you get when you haven't seen the video yet. And that's how it's going to be with this one. This is from, this one is from Prager U, from our good, dear friends at Prager University. That is totally a university and, you know, not like a fake university. And they, they have decided, they have decided to team up with Stephen Meyer of, I believe it's the Discovery Institute. Yes, the Discovery Institute to talk about science and God. So let's not waste any time. Let's jump right in and see what they have to say about science and God. Can you believe in God and science at the same time? So-called new atheists. Yes, you can. Yes, 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 you can. I don't know what, it, I mean, I guess I can understand colloquially what it means to believe in science, but in a more technical sense, I don't really know what that means. But I, yeah, th th this idea that like you can't be religious and accept science at the same time is obviously wrong. Of course you can. I would rather people who are religious accept science and, you know, do what they can to incorporate science meaningfully into their worldview rather than just outright reject it because they don't like it like Richard Dawkins and scientific materialists like Neil deGrasse Tyson certainly don't think so. To them, religion gets in the way of science. In their view, more science leads to less God. This is not a new position. It was first expressed over 100 years ago by English physician John Draper in a book titled History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science. Draper, who was deeply influenced by Darwin's then new theory of evolution, regarded organized religion as a direct and existential threat to the advancement of science. As he put it, religion and science are absolutely incompatible. They cannot exist together. Mankind must make its choice. It cannot have both. So are science and religion inevitably in conflict? Have they always been? I think if we're talking about um, science and religion, I think that one is interesting because religion is going to be different than mere belief in God or, or belief in God's simplicity or just sort of like a, a, a basic theism. And I, I don't see any conflicts between just general theism and, and science. If, if you're talking some specific religion, however, I do think that there are intrinsic conflicts between any specific religion and science in the sense that there are going to be aspects of one or the other, if not potentially both, that you're going to have to reject. For instance, you either have to reject what the Bible, like with respect to Christianity, you either have to re reject what the Bible says about creation and how the world was created, or you have to Re reject what science says about what we know about the development of life. So if you accept the science, if you accept what science says with respect to the origin and evolution of life, you would be disagreeing with what the Bible says and vice versa. And I think you're going to find this in most areas of science, cosmology, medicine, biology, things of that chemistry, physics, things of that nature in Christianity, in Judaism, in Islam, in Hinduism, you're going to find that the fundamental teachings of these religions, not in every instance, but in many, are in direct disagreement with what we know about science. So the whole question of science and God or science and theism, I do think is a little different than the discussion about science and religion, since religion is much more specific, has specified teachings that you're not going to find in theism simpliciter. And so I think that with respect to the latter, what, what you have... 
in, in terms of uh, science and specifically religion, what you're going to have is, in some sense, a rejection of aspects of science, aspects of that religion, or both. And I just, just to, to finish on that point, you don't have that problem with science and theism generally, at least I don't think. Well, not exactly. In fact, the giants who established modern science, astronomer Johannes Kepler, chemist Robert Boyle, physicist Sir Isaac Newton, and others, were deeply religious men. They didn't see any conflict between science and religion. On the contrary, they thought that by doing science, they were discovering God's design and revealing it to mankind. Indeed, it's no exaggeration to say that the Judeo-Christian religious tradition led directly to modern science. Yeah, no, that wouldn't be correct, though. Um, see, th th this is this is something you hear a lot that Judeo-Christian values are what led to like modern science and modern morality and modern society and all this stuff. But they're focusing on just modern science here. Not that PragerU hasn't pushed the whole Judeo-Christian values are like the reason that the Western world is as developed as it is. You know, it's funnily enough, a thing you also hear from a lot of white supremacists. But we're not going to get there uh, in this video. Um, so yeah, this idea that Judeo-Christian religious tradition um, is like gave rise to modern science is just patently false. Some of the earliest uh, developers of the scientific method, I believe one of them was actually a Muslim scholar. He was studying a lot of, I think, medicine and chemistry and optics and stuff like that. And if I, I, I can't think of his name, I'd, I'd have to go and look it up. But I believe that he discovered some things about optics before even Chris John Huygens did. So, um, this idea that it's specifically like Judeo-Christian values isn't true. Many Hindus contributed to mathematics, medicine, science. Um, many pagans contributed to these areas as well. The idea that specifically Judeo-Christian, which would be Judaism, Christianity, and some might throw Islam in there, some won't. Um, but I'll throw it in there just to give them an extra one because the, uh, the, the, the Muslims contributed heavily to the areas of mathematics and medicine. But we have pagans, we have Hindus, we have you know many, many Chinese and Asian non-Christian cultures or non-Judeo-Christian cultures that contributed to science and mathematics and medicine and all this stuff. And uh, like, like this, this is not something that that's esoteric to anybody that understands history of science like it's really just not this idea that it's specifically judeo-christian traditions and judeo-christian values that led to modern science is patently false and no historian of science or philosopher of science would be willing to grant that were there judeo-christian individuals that contributed obviously there were like i said hindus that contributed people of asian cultures that contributed people of pagan cultures that contributed the medicine that was learned by many Western Europeans, um, or um, yeah, Western Europeans from the natives when they came to North, Central, and Southern America. All of these things, these people didn't believe in Judeo-Christian values. It's simply not true. It, it is just, it is absolutely, I would say it's patently false, this argument that modern science, or really any aspect of modern society, is somehow predicated on primarily Judeo-Christian values or traditions. To back up this claim, Cambridge University historian of science, Joseph Needham, posed a famous why there, why then question. Why there in Europe? Why then in the 16th and 17th centuries? Why didn't modern science start somewhere else before then? After all, the Egyptians erected pyramids. The Chinese invented the compass, block printing, and gunpowder. Romans built marvelous roads and aqueducts. The Greeks had great philosophers. Yet none of these cultures developed the systematic methods for investigating nature that arose in Western Europe during the 16th and 17th centuries. The problem here is everything that he just listed in terms of the mathematical developments, the engineering developments, were built off of largely, rather I would say effectively, the same methodology. You see, th this is the thing, and I, I don't really want to tie this in because this is not supposed to be a super political video at all, but the reason I have to tie this in is because it's coming from PragerU. And if there's anything that anybody that watches this video needs to know about PragerU is they are thoroughly a white nationalist organization. They will try to root every development, every aspect of modern society in that it's Judeo-Christian values and traditions that developed it. It's the white, 
Western Europeans that developed all this stuff. You know, the 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 British and and the Nordics and you know these these white people. This is what PragerU does. All um Stephen Meyer is doing right now is reading from a script. Everything that they just list listed in terms of what the Chinese did, in terms of what the Egyptians did, in terms of what the Romans did, these people did develop them through the same systematic methodologies that we use today. Now, obviously, they were a little bit more primitive. They didn't have the same technological advancements that we have. They didn't have the mathematical developments that we had. But if you were to take the developments that they did have, they had a systematic methodology for doing science. So this idea that, this, that, that modern science was rooted in specifically white Western European culture is not true. I tried to Google the um, scholar that he's mentioning because I have a feeling if I look this person up, I'm going to find perhaps some controversial things about them, but who knows? Um, but yeah, the, the, they're, they're citing what one person said and then running this as if it's, if it's the, the standard. I can tell you because I've spoken with them and there are a few of them in our community here on YouTube that do history and philosophy of science that would say this is just not true. If you look at what the Chinese, with the with the Africans, with the Muslims, the Hindus were developing, they were contributing just as much to science as everybody else was. And they formed a lot of the foundations that the Europeans built themselves off of. The Europeans, Sir Isaac Newton, Christian Huygens, um, Johannes Kepler, all of these men were standing on the shoulders of giants, just like Einstein and Eddington and Schrodinger were themselves standing on the shoulders of giants. This realization led Needham and other historians of science such as Ian Barber and Herbert Butterfield, to look for some other X factor to explain why the scientific revolution occurred where and when it did. Here's the conclusion they reached. Only the Judeo-Christian West had the necessary intellectual presuppositions to enable the rise of science. So what were those presuppositions? Uh, I'm gonna replay that for you guys. I want you to listen to the language that's being used here. Scientific revolution occurred where and when it did. Here's the conclusion they reached. Only the Judeo-Christian West had the necessary intellectual presuppositions to enable the rise of science. So what, what, what do you guys out there in the audience and those that are listening to this on the playback, what do you suppose, knowing that this is coming from a place like Prague or you, what do you suppose they're trying to imply there? The intellectual presuppositions I, I got to tell you, they PragerU almost doesn't even hide it anymore. See, this is why I like PragerU's videos. There, there's so much in them that you can break open that you just – you see how ridiculous PragerU is as – well, as a quote-unquote – and. I, those are very large quotes, media outlet. They just – but anyway, I'm curious to know what these presuppositions are. That apparently and what nobody were those else presuppositions? Had. We can identify three. All find their origin in the Judeo-Christian idea of a creator God who fashioned an ordered universe. First, the founders of modern science. But wait, hold on. What, hold on. Though. The Hindus believed that. The Romans believed that. The Asians believed that. Many of these faiths may have been more polytheistic, but they believed that there was a creator god or gods. They've believed that we, through discovering the natural world and how it works, can come to understand how they created and designed the world. Like that, that idea of, a, of creator god or gods, you know, that they designed the world and that you know, we can learn about their creation and how they designed it through understanding it is not unique to Judeo-Christianity. That's a thing that many, many, many religious cultures throughout the thousands, tens of thousands of years of human history have believed. Science assumed the intelligibility of nature. 
What? Okay. No. Oh, Lord. No. The, we don't. You don't. No. Oh, my God. This is so bad. So you don't assume the intelligibility of nature. The fact that we can learn about nature means that it's intelligible, and you can be non-Judeo-Christian and learn things about the fucking world. I don't even know where we're at right now. We assume the intelligibility of nature. Literally every human has access to that. And they did long before Judeo-Christianity came about. That nature had been designed by the mind of a rational God, the same God who made the rational minds of human beings. Thus these men assumed that if they use their minds to carefully study nature, they could understand the order and design that God had placed in the world. Second, they assumed an underlying order in nature. This was best... Again, you can see this, especially in the, the, the Hindu writings. Um, there's a lot of stuff in ancient Hindu writings about the order of nature and everything like that. Again, the, he's, he's taking things that are assumed by like all people who like have an idea of the world that we can understand it. We can quantify and qualify it that it, it seems to have an orderly and consistent operation. Like th th this idea that, oh, well, these were assumptions that only the great white Western European Judeo-Christian people had, as if the thousands of years of human intellectual culture before like the 1600s didn't write about these same things. But it's, but th th this is the thing with, with white nationalists, guys. They don't read anything about real history. They don't learn about history. That's why they believe the things that they do. Expressed by the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, who argued there can be no living science unless there is a widespread instinctive conviction in the order of nature, a conviction he attributed to belief in the rationality of God. This idea led to the unprecedented use of... You know what's funny is... They're citing a guy who literally just said that this this ability to see the order in nature is instinctive, and then he's utilizing what that same guy said to argue that you have to presuppose Judeo-Christian traditions and values in order to for, to for that presupposition that he's citing somebody who says that it's instinctual to be there. This, this is just, holy shit, Prager, you, you've done it again mathematics to describe the orderly processes at work in the world. And it inspired the invention of better instruments, such as telescopes and microscopes, to see that order. And third, these founders of modern science presupposed the contingency of nature. This simply means that God had many choices about how to make an orderly world. Just as there are many ways to design a clock, there were many ways that God could have designed the universe. To discover how he did, scientists cannot merely deduce the order of nature by assuming what seemed most logical to them, that is, merely using reason alone to draw conclusions, as the Greek philosophers had tried to do. For example, the Greeks thought that since the most perfect form of motion was a circle, they assumed that the planets must have circular orbits, something that Kepler later refuted by careful observation. Indeed, because of their theological convictions, the new scientists realized that they would have to observe, test, and measure in order to understand God's design. To these men, nature was like a book, a form of divine communication, intelligible to human investigation. For this reason, they also developed the concept of the laws of nature, implying God's governance over the natural order. Yeah, that's not where the term laws of nature comes from. They were called laws because they didn't change, and we, we didn't, at least at that time, think that they could. I, this, I don't even know where we're at right now. Like, everything that he's saying apparently didn't exist until like the 1600s and 1700s has been around since like the 600s. This, this is your brain when you don't know history, guys.
this this is what happens to your brain when you don't actually learn anything about history. All the mathematics that he's citing, a lot of it, a hell of a lot of it was developed, or like a lot of algebra. Why do you think it's called algebra? Because it was developed by Muslims. Um, the Hindus, the Asians, all of these, these cultures developed algebra and geometry very, very, very extensively. The same mathematics that he's talking about that all of his beautiful white Western scientists relied on. Science was a way to decipher that order. The idea that science and religion are in conflict is a popular belief today. But the history of science shows otherwise. All of us, laymen and scientists alike, owe a great debt to the Judeo-Christian tradition. Without that... Uh, no, we owe a great debt to people who asked questions and wanted to learn more about the world. We don't owe it to some religious faith because, again... Almost every religion that exists on the planet today, especially, has contributed greatly to the development of science, mathematics, and modern technology. That tradition, we'd be living in a much more primitive world, morally and scientifically. I'm Stephen Meyer, historian and philosopher of science at the Discovery Institute for <laughs> Prager University. Was the universe always here? Or did it have a beginning? If so, how did it start? From ancient times, philosophers and theologians have debated these questions. But it wasn't until the 20th century that a series of stunning scientific discoveries finally enabled us to get some answers. The story begins in 1912, when American astronomer Vesto Slipher observed that light coming from distant nebulae, clouds of dust and gas in outer space, appeared redder than expected. Why was this important? Here's where your high school science pays off. Remember learning about the Doppler effect? The frequency of sound, light, or other waves changes as the source and observer move toward or away from each other. To demonstrate this, your science teacher likely played a recording of a train whistle. The pitch of the whistle lowers, that is the sound wave stretches out as the train recedes into the distance. Well, the same thing happens with light. If a distant star or galaxy is moving away from us, the light coming from that object will also stretch out. Since in the spectrum of visible light, red light corresponds to the longest wavelengths, physicists say light that has been stretched out has been red-shifted. This evidence of redshift suggested the nebulae were moving away from us. In 1924, astronomer Edwin Hubble working with a new 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson in California, showed that Slipher's nebulae were not just clouds of gas around distant stars, but actually distant galaxies beyond our Milky Way. Soon after that, the Belgian physicist Georges Lemaitre correlated Slipher's redshift data with Hubble's measurements of the distances to other galaxies. Lemaitre showed that galaxies that were farther away were receding faster than those close at hand. That suggested a spherical expansion of the universe in all directions of space, as if the universe were expanding like... Um, spherical is not the right word to use there. The universe doesn't have like a, a shape in that sense. The word you would be looking for is metric, metric expansion of the scale in space-time. Like a balloon from a singular explosive beginning. Um, no. The Big Bang was not an explosion. There is no center to the universe. The universe is not expanding outward from a point. It is a metric expansion of its scale measured over sufficient distances. From a Big Bang. Oddly, Albert Einstein had earlier tumbled to this idea, but then dismissed it. Einstein's new theory of gravity, known as general relativity, envisioned massive bodies altering the curvature of space, like a bowling ball making a depression on a trampoline. Einstein's concept of gravity implied that space would contract in on itself unless gravity was continually counteracted by the expansion of space. For this reason, Einstein posited a constantly acting repulsive force, known as the cosmological constant to counter gravitational attraction. But that implied a dynamic and expanding universe, and also 
a beginning. To avoid this conclusion, it doesn't actually imply a beginning. It just implied that space time was expanding, which was not the consensus of scientists at the time. And so Einstein created his fudge factor, the cosmological constant, to keep space time static in accordance with what was the consensus at the time. And this was actually done prior to um, Edwin Hubble's uh, um, observation of galactic redshift, which is what eventually caused Einstein to say that adding the cosmological constant was the biggest blunder of his career. Einstein altered his own equations by arbitrarily assigning a precise value to the force of expansion to ensure that the strength of gravity and the repulsive force exactly balanced. Thus, he depicted the universe in a perfectly poised static state, neither expanding from a beginning nor contracting toward a collapse. But then with Slipher and Hubble's discoveries, the heavens talked back. In 1927, Lemaitre informed Einstein, in a taxi cab no less, about the redshift evidence for an expanding universe. In 1931, Einstein visited Hubble at the Mount Wilson Observatory. I think it's also probably worth pointing out that it actually wasn't Einstein himself that showed that his equations essentially gave an expanding space-time. It was Alexandre Friedman who derived the solutions which did that, and they're known as the Friedman solutions to Einstein's field equations. So it technically wasn't Einstein himself that did that. Tory and viewed the evidence for himself. Later, he announced, to his great credit, that denying the evidence for the universe having had a beginning was the greatest blunder of my scientific career. And here we see the misinformation. He, Einstein did not say this about the universe ha having a beginning or not. He said this about it expanding. See how, see how they're doing that? They're trying to weasel it in there as if this is all evidence for a beginning of the universe, and it's not. This is all evidence that the universe is expanding, which does not necessitate a beginning, as any cosmologist, competent cosmologist, or somebody who actually understands the subject will tell you. So the greatest blunder of my scientific career was his statement about his addition to the cosmological logical constant into his equations to keep space-time static. He did not say that about the universe having a beginning or not. Throughout the 20th century, physicists proposed other theories that denied a cosmic beginning. One by one, new evidence showed each to be inadequate. By the 1990s, the Big Bang theory had prevailed as the best explanation for multiple lines of astronomical evidence. So why was such evidence upsetting to Einstein and to many other scientists? It wasn't. Einstein wasn't really upset by, again, it, the, the scientists were just at a consensus. The, the, the universe is static. As they understood it, it didn't make sense to speak about the universe itself expanding or contracting. They didn't look at the universe as a thing like that. And then Einstein comes along and shows that space-time is this fundamental manifold that is physical and that is real and that can be curved and warped and sheared. And then his somebody else took his equation and his equations and also showed that uh, hey, it's also it's undergoing a metric expansion. Well, that was not what the consensus at the time was. So they said, well. Most of the physicists believe that the universe is static, so there must be a fluke in the equations. Let me add in this the, this thing to keep it static. Like, this had nothing to do with the beginning of the universe. The, Einstein wasn't upset about that. He wasn't even upset. Why are we acting like these scientists hated this? They didn't. Princeton University physicist Robert Dickey explained, an infinitely old universe would relieve us of the necessity of explaining the origin of matter at any finite time in the past. And so it would. But if the physical universe of matter, energy, space, and time had a beginning, it becomes extremely difficult to conceive of a physical or material cause for the origin of the universe. After Having a beginning doesn't mean origin. I mean, your house begins at the front door, but the front door is not the origin of your house. That's not how, how it works. For all, it was matter and energy that first came into existence at the Big Bang. No, nothing came into existence at the Big Bang. Inflation precedes the Big Bang. All the matter and energy in the universe existed at the moment of the Big Bang.
before that, no matter or energy would have yet existed to do the causing. How, what do you mean when you say would have yet existed, which is a temporal term, but you're outside of space time, which itself doesn't make any sense because outside is a spatial temporal term. And you start to see the problem of trying to talk about things existing or doing things in some, I don't know, flowery sense of being external to space time, but you still want to use spatial temporal terms to, to describe them. There, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of presuppositions here that, most physicists that study the early universe, most cosmologists are going to just shake their heads up. Consequently, whatever did cause the universe to exist would need to be immaterial and exist beyond space and time. What does that mean? What does it mean to exist beyond space? Beyond is a spatio-temporal term. The word beyond refers to a physical object extant through space-time and the relation that it shares with some other object or set of objects that are physical and also extant through space-time. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't under, I, I also we're sort of presupposing that the universe would have a cause. Why would the universe be a thing that has a cause, especially when the earliest moments of the universe were quantum mechanical and we know that causes aren't really a thing at the quantum mechanical level of reality. To many scientists and philosophers, all this sounds an awful lot like the first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I'm Stephen Meyer of the Discovery Institute and author of Return of the God Hypothesis. Oh, by the way, this is like all five videos put together, so you're going to see a lot of these. Um, I'm Stephen Meyer with the Discovery Institute. For Prager University. Did you guys hear that? He's Stephen Meyer for Prager University. Does a design require a designer? Keep that question in mind as we look at some new scientific discoveries about the origin of life in the universe. Since Charles Darwin... I don't know, guys. Does a cloud require a clouder? Does rain require a rainer? Does lightning require a lightninger? Does water require a water? I mean, I could just literally sit here for hours and ask this question about all sorts of things. Let's just see where he's going to take this. Darwin published his theory of evolution. In By the way, I do want to say we're about halfway, okay, a little under halfway through this, and I haven't heard anything rigorous yet. I, I actually, I have to be honest with you guys. I uh, maybe I just should not have had as high of um, expectations, I guess you could say. But I actually was expecting there to be a little bit more rigor. Like if the last one was the video for just like the whole cosmological argument, beginning of the universe. That was very poorly done. There was practically no substance to that, whatever. But I suppose it's Prager University. It's Prager U. Knowing their audience, you probably couldn't put much more substance into it because you'd lose them way too quickly. 1859, many scientists have denied that design requires a designer. Darwinists have long claimed that the mechanism of natural selection could generate the appearance or illusion of design without being directed or guided in any way. Recently, however, even staunch Darwinists have acknowledged that living things may have certain features that display evidence of actual intelligent design. Though there I I'd be curious who's saying that, because I can assure you that is not being said by any competent foremost researchers in the field, and it isn't being published in any of the foremost literature, which is being published in some of the world's foremost peer-reviewed academic presses. Uh, also, as to this, does design require a designer? The thing is, at least in a philosophical sense, the word design implies intent. It implies that there is an intention there to make a thing, to do a thing. So design implies a designer. Yes, that's uh, actually right here. Holy shit, somebody already beat me to it in the chat. It's definitional. It's analytic. It's like asking, is a bachelor an unmarried man? Well, yeah, that's kind of what bachelor means, buddy. It's like, does design imply a designer? That's kind of what design is, and that's th that's where the real question comes comes into play here. Is it reasonable to say that 
that these things are designed. And most of the professionals, the vast majority of professionals are going to say that the complex structures and the functions that they engage in that we observe in life are going to be teleonomic not teleologic, meaning that they're going to look designed insofar as they're very highly complex and functional, but they're not actually designed by anything at least as far as we can tell. And if they were, I would bet pretty much any written amount of money that it isn't a god, it was extraterrestrials from far, far away. Ideas about who designed life on Earth are, well, a bit out there. Some prominent scientists have proposed that space aliens designed and then transported life to Earth. Evolutionary by The funny thing is, though, the idea that life was in some way, shape, or form created by or designed by or delivered here, what have you, whatever combination of them you want to use, by extraterrestrials is always going to be more likely than the idea of some non-natural, non-physical, non-spatial, non-temporal, intelligent mind, which is a, 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 a hell of a concept in and of itself. The idea that that created life is intrinsically, significantly less plausible than life having been created or designed or delivered here by extraterrestrials from far, far away. Biologist and noted atheist Richard Dawkins has even floated this idea, suggesting that extraterrestrials may be responsible for a possible signature of intelligence in life. Indeed, no less a scientific genius than Francis Crick, who helped discover DNA, also proposed the idea that ETs seeded life on Earth to set the evolutionary process in motion. If true, we have an intergalactic Johnny Appleseed to thank for starting the chain reaction that has taken us from inanimate matter to Shakespeare. So why have these scientists considered this seemingly far-fetched possibility? I did want to say this whole inanimate matter to Shakespeare, the, 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 the way that they talk about this, we aren't made of any different type of matter at the like the fundamental level than rocks the only difference is that the structure and function of the matter like when we talk about inanimate matter to shakespeare shakespeare's made of the same stuff that rocks are protons neutrons and electrons it's just organized differently um i mean i'm not a myriological nihilist but i i would say that actually myriological nihilism just seems trivially true I, like, of course everything is just a different arrangement of what are fundamentally the same three parts, protons, neutrons, and electrons. It's just, I reject the idea that we don't need to refer to those different parts by different... Anyway, I'm not going to get into myriological nihilism here. Because they have encountered a big mystery they can't explain. It turns out that even the simplest living cells aren't simple at all. And that discovery has made it extremely difficult to explain the origin of life. Recall from biology class that Crick... Yeah, um, quantum mechanics has is, is been proven to be extremely difficult, and it's made it hard to explain, you know, gravity on a quantum scale. I mean, does that mean that there's, like, magical quantum gravity fairies flying around doing some magic and making it all work? I don't think anybody would be so quick to posit that. I think they would just say, this is a complex issue that humans have not figured out yet because there are things that we don't know about reality yet. And his partner, James Watson, discovered the structure of the DNA molecule. When they did, they also realized that the chemical subunits in DNA function like letters in a written language or digital symbols in a computer code. As Bill Gates has explained, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. This is what you call a quote mine. Mind you, Bill Gates is not a biologist. He's not a molecular biologist. He's not an evolutionary biologist. He's not a geneticist. He's not a biochemist. And all of the people who are say it's not like a computer program or a computer code. The genetic code is a code which is why we call it the genetic code. But DNA is not a code. 
it is a molecule that is represented by a code table that was convented by humans as a means of quantifying, or you could say qualifying, DNA as a molecule. Which kind of suggests a master programmer. Could such an intelligent designer have been an alien, as Crick and Dawkins have suggested? Perhaps. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, perhaps. But there are problems with this explanation, big ones. Uh, yeah. And First, the spaceship too. theory does not actually solve the problem of the ultimate origin of life. In fact, it dodges the whole... Well, yeah, but this is moving the goalposts. We, uh, we're wanting to know how life started here on Earth. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, sir, if we showed that life on Earth was started by extraterrestrials, we might want to ask, okay, where did, where did they come from? Like, how did they as a living organisms develop? But we haven't gotten that far yet. So to like start jumping to, yeah, but where did the aliens come from? That, that, that doesn't matter. First, we need to explain life here. And we then need to explain it through extraterrestrials successfully to, before we can start asking where they came from. Like, we haven't even established that life is created by extraterrestrials. So slow down there, buckaroo. Question of where this super smart alien came from. How did he evolve? How did the first life and the genetic information necessary to produce it first arise on his planet? How do you know that he comes from a planet? How do you know that he has DNA? How do you know that he evolved? Why are you assuming all of these things that you don't know? Why are you jumping to conclusions? Why do creationists always do this dumb bullshit? But there is something else the ET hypothesis does not explain. Modern physics has revealed evidence of design in the very fabric of the universe. Physicists have discovered that the fundamental physical parameters of our universe have been finely tuned against all odds to make our universe capable of hosting life. Uh, no, they haven't shown that. What physicists have done is utilize the conventional quantification methods that we have for describing what we presume to be the most fundamental symmetries that we can observe in physical systems. All the numbers and per this and of that that are involved in quantifying all of the constants and parameters are 100% conventional. All the various methods that we use from meters to nano, you know, all that stuff is all convinced. Like, we, we made those up. The meter is made up by humans. The second is made up by humans. The gram is made up by humans. All of these, every unit of measurement that we use, we made up. Now, we made it up out of something generally that we saw in reality. For example, the astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, but using it, it's 100% arbitrary and conventional. And it's the same with the fundamental constants and parameters. They're just symmetries between physical systems and nature. What they do and what arises out of them is not for anything. Even the slightest alterations in the values of key factors, such as the strength of gravity or electromagnetism or the masses of elementary particles, would render life impossible. Um, no, it wouldn't. It would render life as we know it probably not existent. But we don't know if there are other forms of life that could persist. We don't know if maybe forms of life as we understand it could also persist. The, also, the, this idea that, well, if you change these fundamental parameters, you'd get a universe that looks drastically different. I, I'm sorry, but, like, no shit? What... If I change the, 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 the length and the width of a table, I'll have a different size table. No shit. I don't, like, this isn't, this isn't profound. This, the, oh, well, if we change the, the, the fundamental parameters of reality, it, reality would look way different. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of how it works. That doesn't mean that the parameters were put into their values by somebody for some goal.
And uh, another thing is what, what this really means is that any universe that has its specific parameters is finely tuned for specifically whatever that universe is. All universes are finely tuned for whatever they are. So whether or not there's life in it, uh, you could say that there's universe finely tuned such that life cannot ever arise in them. You could look at any universe and claim that it's finely tuned for something if you wanted to. We live in a kind of Goldilocks universe where the fundamental forces of physics have just the right balance and the properties of matter have just the right characteristics and configurations to make life possible. But we don't know that, though. We, we do not actually know under what constants and parameters life broadly could or could not develop. Now, if you want to speak about specifically life as we know it, then, yeah, I, I mean, if you change the parameters, those that would probably not exist. But th the biggest thing is we don't have a way of establishing the probability of the constants and parameters that we observe for our universe having the values they do given either theism or given naturalism we just don't we can't even start this argument because we don't have the fundamental information necessary to run it you don't know what the probability of the universe looking like the one that we see is on any worldview you don't have that information so to, to sit there and say, yeah, what these constants are put here specifically so that life would exist, but we don't know what conditions, what forms of life may or may not exist under, number one. There's just so much we don't know about the probability space that to argue that it's, it's as small as it is is only given the parameters that we can put into it. We don't have access to all of them. To illustrate this idea, the late Cambridge physicist Sir John Polkinghorne imagined a universe-creating machine with numerous dials, each representing some critical parameter. The various dials each have an almost infinite range of settings, yet all are set just right. Not surprisingly, Polkinghorne and many physicists... What do we mean by just right? Like, they'll say, oh yeah, but the, the constants are just right for life. Yeah, but you're presuming life has some privileged frame of reference in the universe such that the universe is structured with life as the intended outcome which seems to presuppose intention which seems like begging the question have concluded that the improbable cosmic fine-tuning of our actual universe points to a cosmic fine-tuner as legendary but we haven't actually established that the universe is fine-tuned. We don't really have the capability of establishing that. Very Cambridge astrophysicist Sir Fred Hoyle argued, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics to make life possible. Could this super intellect have been an alien? Not a chance. Cosmic fine-tuning has been present from the beginning of the universe and thus cannot be explained by any agent that arises after the beginning. Instead, fine-tuning is better explained by an intelligent agent outside the universe who could design its structure as a whole. To avoid this conclusion, some physicists have postulated another speculative hypothesis, the existence of a vast number of other parallel universes. This so-called multiverse idea portrays our universe as the outcome of a cosmic lottery, in which some universe-generating mechanism spits out billions and billions of universes, so many that our universe, with its improbable combination of life-conducive factors, would eventually have to arise. Yet advocates of the multiverse overlook an obvious problem. All such proposals, whether based on something called inflationary cosmology or string theory, postulate universe-generating mechanisms that themselves require prior unexplained fine-tuning, thus taking us back to the need for an ultimate or transcendent fine-tuner or designing intelligence. Many of us call this intelligence God. I'm Stephen Meyer, Discovery Institute Senior Fellow and author of Return of the God Hypothesis for Prager University. One thing I would like to say on fine-tuning is that and I know there's some that 
aren't keen on this objection, but I do think it's an interesting observation, especially with respect to a, a, a little bit more of a specified claim that the, not just that the universe is fine tuned in the esoteric sense that physicists mean that isn't what like apologists like Stephen Meyer here are, would would like to say, but um, I think it's I, I do think it's important to point out. Human beings, most if not all life as we know it, most of it can't even survive in most places on the planet that it evolved on. That's pretty interesting. Like humans, humans cannot exist reasonably without major, major accommodations on at least 71% of the planet because it's covered in water and humans can't live in water. Many, most of the, the, the life forms, I don't know if I'd say most, many life forms on the planet can, cannot do that. Many, if not most life forms on the planet would not survive on most of the planet that they evolved on. Let alone 99.9999999% of the rest of the universe where they would die very, very quickly. On top of that, the amount of matter that, that, that humans are constructed of, baryonic matter, is about 4% of the total mass energy density of space-time, of the universe. And 99.9999999% of that is in the form of plasma, which isn't going to be able to sustain life. It's in the form of really, really hot clouds of, of plasma or in the form of stars. Go ahead, Titan. Um, so we are made of... Uh, a, an entirely negligible fraction of an entirely negligible fraction of the total mass energy density of the universe. We would die practically everywhere in the universe. We would die on the vast majority of our own planet. I, I just, I don't know what it means to say that the universe is finely tuned for life. If all that is meant is that the parameters simply allow for life to potentially maybe develop, I, what? I, sure, I don't know what you mean by fine tuning. You're, you're still going to have to make the jump to from that to some intelligence made it that way rather than us simply being a result of the way that the universe is structured. You need to show that structure is has an intention behind it. And the funny thing is, they never do that. They never get you get to soup to get get to constraints on the parameters of our universe to therefore that was done intentionally so that we could exist. That jump is never made. Chances are, if you've heard anything about intelligent design, you've heard that it's a faith-based, not a science-based idea. Or maybe you've even heard it's- And that would be true. Religion masquerading well, as science. It's not really religion. It's utilized by religious people though. Is that true? Well, why don't largely yes? Don't you decide. According to evolutionary biologists such as Richard Dawkins of Oxford University, living systems give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose, but that appearance is merely an illusion. Why? Well, according to Dawkins and his followers, undirected processes such as natural selection and random mutations can produce the intricate design-like structures in living systems. In their view. Natural selection can mimic the powers of a designing intelligence without being guided or directed in any way. In contrast, the proponents of intelligent design argue that there are telltale features of living systems and the universe that are best explained by a designing intelligence. The, the thing is, so, and, and this, is, this is where the, the, the whole intelligent design argument really falls apart. The, these telltale features of design that, that we're, we often hear about are things like complexity, order, and function. But we could run down a laundry list of experiments where very highly complex systems, highly ordered systems, or systems containing large amounts of specified function can arise entirely stochastically. Anybody who has a strong grasp of chemistry knows that these things can happen. 
On top of that, we can show things that are designed and that we know are designed that are not complex at all, that don't have much order, or that don't really have much of a specified function. So when you take both of those facts, it's what, 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 it, what seems to be implied here is that things like features like complexity, order, and function are not telltale features of design. We can point to things that we know are not designed that possess all of those features, and we can point to things that we know are designed that possess none of them. So the, 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 the thing is, design is not inferred from the physical attributes of something. It's inferred from our prior knowledge or experience of that thing being designed. When you see a watch on the beach, you don't know it's designed because of what it looks like and you know that it, it's got all these various physical attributes. You know that it's designed because you know that it's a watch and you know that humans design watches. Just like if you see a, a, a collection, a little round bundle of sticks with an indentation in the middle and some feathers in it. You know that was designed by a bird because you know that birds design birds' nests and have feathers. So when we talk about things being designed, you're never going to be able to get to design just by an examination of the physical attributes that something has. Because there will always be examples of non-designed things which do possess those attributes and designed things which do not. And so the question to ask somebody running an intelligent design argument is, in virtue of what do features like complexity, order, and function infer or imply design? So what telltale signs of intelligence are we talking about? There are many, hmm. but let's focus here on just one. The digital code stored in the DNA molecule. Um, it's not a digital code. And, and there, there isn't a code stored in the molecule because you can't store something in a molecule. That doesn't really make sense. Um, the genetic code is a convented code table that humans use to qualify what DNA is and how it operates. In 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick mapped out the structure of the DNA molecule. Along the interior of their famed double helix, they discovered a four-character code at work. They soon realized that seek They didn't discover a four-character code. They discovered four molecules that are arranged in certain patterns, and the arrangement of those molecules will give different chemical reactions that produce different chemicals, and that we can represent those different codon triplets utilizing different letters. We found that there are four codon triplets that are um, repeating, and we use four different letters that represent the, the first letter of the name of each of those, those individual molecules. We, we utilize letters to represent them and then created the, the genetic code table to represent the structure of these molecules and what, what chemical reactions those molecules prescribe and what chemicals will be produced from those reactions. Different codon structures give rise to different chemical reactions, result in different chemicals produced. Sequences of precisely positioned chemicals called nucleotide bases store and transmit the assembly instructions, the information for building the crucial protein molecules that cells need to survive. No protein molecules, no life. Crick later proposed that the chemical constituents, as far as we know, like, like, now, four billion years later, no proteins, no life. But the, the earliest forms of life, or at least proto-life, may not have used proteins. ...in DNA function like letters in a written language or digital symbols in a computer code. Just as well-functioning computer code depends upon precise sequences of zeros and ones, so too does the function of the DNA molecule depend upon the specific arrangement of chemical bases along the spine of the double helix. Yes, yes, because the, the, those proteins that are being produced by the ribosome, if you have different chemical structures, you'll get different chemical reactions that produce different chemical structures themselves that would then result 
in different proteins produced. That's all proteins are. They're the result of a chemical chain reaction. That's, that's all this is. It's chemical chain reactions. If you change the structure of these chemicals, you can change the reactions that they can engage in, and you can change the, the resultant chemicals from those reactions. This is not complicated. It's quite simple chemistry. Well, it's actually not simple chemistry, but it is chemistry. Famed biotech specialist Leroy Hood describes the information stored in DNA as digital code. Even Richard Dawkins has yeah, except that it's not acknowledged. The machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. But where did this information, this digital code, come from? What do you mean by "come from"? Everything in the universe contains information. The information is the structure of the codons. And that was probably developed over millions of years of evolutionary processes for which structures produce the, the most stable chemicals. Today, this question lies at the heart of a great scientific mystery, the mystery of the origin of life. Building a living cell requires many proteins, and building proteins requires genetic information in DNA or some other equivalent molecule. Yet to date, no theory of undirected chemical evolution can explain the origin of the digital information needed to build the first living cell from simpler non-living chemicals. Well, there is no digital information, and I like how they, they, they snuck in no theory of undirected, as if they've got a theory, you don't. Intelligent design isn't and can't be a theory because it can't, it can't make predictions that can be confirmed because any predictions, as we've seen, because they keep modifying intelligent design every time new findings come along, it, it, it can fit with any predictions, and therefore it doesn't actually explain or account for why we see what we see because it could fit with any observation of what we see, which is why intelligent design proponents keep modifying their model, even though more data comes in that shows that the model is more and more likely to be incorrect. They just keep modifying it because it can fit with any data because it doesn't explain any data. In other words, the problem of getting life from non-life. Why is this a problem? because humans don't know everything and cannot go back to see the complex chemical reactions that would have been involved. There is simply too much information in the cell to be explained by chance alone. The problem That's why it's probably a good thing chance isn't what statisticians and and, and and biologists and biochemists use. This idea of a by chance alone or by pure unguided processes, by pure random chance People who make these kinds of statements just demonstrate they don't know anything about chemistry because, albeit that this stuff is stochastic, when they talk about random chance, they're ignoring that there are stability factors here. There are numerous reaction factors that you have to consider that can dictate what kinds of reactions are going to occur, when, on what kinds of chemicals are going to occur, what's going to result from them, a lot of this stuff. And that systems are going to tend towards stable and... um what's the other word? Sable and symbiotic processes and structures. The ability of generating a section of DNA code capable of building just one functional protein by chance is vanishingly small. Even taking into account... Yeah, that's actually because the process for producing proteins is extraordinarily convoluted beyond what you would ever need to produce proteins. The multi-billion year history of the universe. And even the simplest living cells require hundreds of proteins. Thus, the given enough time, anything is possible argument no longer works. I don't know anybody who's ever made that argument. I don't think people made make that argument. Origin of life researchers agree. The chance hypothesis has failed. What is the chance hypothesis? Who, who, like th this idea that literally by nothing other than random chance, like yet nobody's, nobody's saying that. I don't, I don't think a prof uh, any professional in the field has ever said, yeah, it's literally just chance, because that doesn't explain anything. You can't go out and, and predict chance. You can't test for it. It's no different than intelligent design. It doesn't account for anything. Chemistry doesn't help us either. Unlike uh, well, yes, it does. Like, this is literally just chemistry that we're talking about. 
to say that chemistry doesn't help us is just to demonstrate sheer ignorance of origins of life and how how much it relies on biochemistry, geochemistry, astrobiology, atmospheric chemistry, all of these things. Like basic chemical compounds, like a crystal of salt, the chemical letters in the DNA message do not arrange themselves as a result of mutual attraction. Saying otherwise... Well, no shit, because that's not how molecules really bond together. Man, they really do not pull in the, 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 the Prager you bringing in the biggest and brightest here, right, guys? Wise would be like saying that the message in a newspaper headline could spontaneously emerge because of the way ink sticks to paper. I don't think anybody competent, at least, has argued that life just spontaneously emerged. Every professional that I've spoken to has said that it was a stepwise biochemical and geochemical process. Clearly something else is at work. In this case, a newspaper editor. Yet proponents of intelligent design do not argue for the theory because all these other theories, chance, chemical laws, or some combination, have failed. Instead, they argue for intelligent design because our uniform and repeated experience, the basis of all scientific reasoning, shows that systems with digital information invariably arise from intelligence. Except you haven't shown any life forms have digital information. I don't think these people know what the word digital means or what the word information means. They're just throwing out words at this point. DNA functions like a software program. Except that it doesn't. It functions like a molecule. We know from experience that software comes from programmers. We know that information, whether inscribed in hieroglyphics, written in a book, or encoded in a radio signal, always arises from an intelligent source. Except that's false. The light that is coming from the sun en encodes information about the sun, such as its luminosity, such as its at least surface temperature, things like that. But the sun was not intelligently designed, even though Stephen Meyer would probably try to say that it was. The, the, the information does not always arise from an intelligent source. No. Gravity is information. Gravity does not arise from an intelligent source. Information is simply that which informs. Anything you, the weight of an object is information about that object. But that doesn't mean the pebble you picked up outside was designed by somebody else. So the discovery of information at the foundation of life in even the simplest living cells provides strong grounds for inferring that a designing intelligence played a role in the origin of life. No. So contrary to what you may have heard, intelligent design is not based on religion, but on scientific discoveries. It is also based on the same method of... How is it based on scientific discoveries when there are things that can account for those discoveries significantly more parsimoniously than intelligent design, which doesn't actually account for these discoveries? That makes no sense scientific reasoning that Charles Darwin used, a method that relies on our uniform experience of cause and effect to guide our theories about what happened. Not all, here, here we see the false notion that science is based on cause and effect. That's not true. Science is based on observations and attempts to account for what is observed via models that are based on methodologies that utilize observation and, and testing and all sorts of things to figure out which models best account for what is observed. Cause and effect doesn't and isn't necessarily a part of that because there are areas of science where cause and effect has no play at all, yet we can still come up with very solid and extraordinarily precise descriptions of what is going on. In the past, you may still wish to dismiss the theory of intelligent design. You're free to believe whatever you like, but you'll have a hard time doing so based on the science. If that were true, intelligent design would have significantly more prominence amongst the scientists, many of whom are actually like religious to some extent. It's just that the, these, these ideas do not account for anything in the world. They don't tell us why the world is the way that it is and not some other way. I'm Stephen Meyer of the Discovery Institute and author of Signature in the Cell for Prager University. 
for Prager University. In a recent University. interview, while I was presenting some scientific discoveries that may point to the existence of God, a camera operator, a young woman whom I'll call Maria, began to weep visibly. Later, she told me the reason for her tears. Like many young people, Maria believed in God when she arrived in college. But while there, she repeatedly encountered professors who insisted that based on the science, God was a myth. No more real than Santa Claus. Maria didn't feel equipped to challenge her professors. She eventually... I'm sorry, but if Maria here was just like blindly just accepting professors saying stuff like this, then... Maria really, really, I, I, like, I don't even know what to say. Don't go to college. Like, why? What? How can you be at college in your mind still be that malleable? Like, you're going to let a college professor saying God is a myth, like, 100% convince you God must be a myth. You don't know how to think for yourself and form your own opinions and examine the world. Okay. Eventually left college with nagging doubts about her faith and wondered whether life, including her own life, might be nothing more than a cosmic accident. Many young people share Maria's doubts. Indeed, powerful voices in the academy tell us that science makes belief in God and human significance untenable. I would be curious who's saying that, because I would almost bet nobody is actually saying that. And science does not make human significance untenable. I, what does that even mean? Science makes human significance untenable. I, okay, whatever. They're I, they're not even using words properly at this point. Or is Richard Dawkins, the famed atheist from Oxford? Why do we keep citing Richard? Holy shit! This is just nothing but quote mine. Richard Dawkins is not like the king of atheism. He's, I would argue, a very poor atheist and does a very poor job at at providing reasons to be an atheist um i would i would recommend people check out like um answers and reason real atheology um nathan over at digital gnosis has some good stuff emerson green is another one who's got some good stuff i suppose you could say my stuff is well it's, it's all right you know I, I try my best um read people like paul draper um schellenberg uh, Mackey's another good one. Why? What? Wh they just they cite Richard Dawkins and Neil deGrasse Tyson like these people, like like own atheism or something. I, I don't. Uh, these aren't atheism's best. And this is funny: is that all these people that bitch and complain about new atheists only ever go after the new atheists? There's very few theists out there or religious people that are going after the 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 Graham Oppies, the 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 Paul Drapers. You know, th these people there, there's very few people going after their work. Now granted there are there are some out there, but you don't see all like in videos like this, th th there has been no real substance to this video at all, but now, then again, we know the reason for that, don't we? You don't want to lose your audience too quickly, do you, Prager? Oh, Lord, that would be bad, wouldn't it? Oxford has asserted, the universe we observe has precisely the properties Here we, we should go expect with this quote. if yep. there is at bottom oh, Lord. no design, no oh, purpose, yeah. nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. But are we the product of such indifference? That is purely materialistic processes that did not have us in mind, as another scientific atheist has put it? Well, technically, yes. Does the universe have the properties we should expect if this all there is is matter vision of reality is correct? Well, all there is matter wouldn't be the view. It would be that the, physic, the, 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 the physical world or the natural world is all which exists. And actually, yes. Um, I mean, the, the hiddenness of God is one that that I think is what we would expect under naturalism, not theism. The gratuitous evil and suffering found throughout life and throughout the whole of evolutionary history on this planet is what we would expect under naturalism, not under theism. The meager moral fruits 
of theists, particularly those that adhere to religions that are supposed to be significantly more morally fulfilling, is something we would expect under naturalism, not theism. The fact that life evolved on this planet and evolved in a way where suffering and almost a sense of indifference are, are crucial to species evolving in ways that, that where they become more successful. That being something that we observe is, is more expected under naturalism than theism. Uh, so yeah, w when, when we look out at the world, it largely looks like the kind of world that we would expect if naturalism were true, not if theism were true. Perhaps not. Three major scientific discoveries contradict the expectations of scientific atheists and point instead in a distinctly God-friendly direction. First, the Big Bang. Discoveries in observational astronomy and developments in theoretical physics have revealed that the universe had a beginning. Yes, had a beginning does not mean begins to exist. This is a point that even William Lane Craig makes. To say that something has a beginning does not carry the same ontic connotations that the term begins to exist carries. Uh, somebody who holds to a tenseless view like myself and any competent physicist or philosopher of physics would um, is going to say that the universe may very well have a beginning. But this, this is a beginning in much the same way that a, a, a yardstick, and this is the example that Dr. Craig gives, the universe under a tenseless view has a beginning in much the same way that a yardstick begins at the first inch. But the yardstick doesn't begin to exist at the first inch. The whole yardstick already exists, and the first inch on it simply serves as sort of a front edge or boundary to that yardstick, at least at one end of it. That's all that someone like me would view the universe as. That Sure, it has a beginning, a front edge, but that wasn't the moment where its existence starts. That wouldn't be the proper way to look at it. Number two, the Big Bang doesn't actually establish that the universe has a beginning. That hasn't actually been established by cosmologists yet. We have preceded the Big Bang. It's called the inflationary epoch, and we only know about the very split second end of the inflationary epoch. We don't know when it started. We don't know how long it lasted for. We don't, we, we, we don't know any of that. So the idea that it's, it's, it's a set in stone fact that the universe has a beginning, it's not, I generally grant it because it doesn't really matter. You can still very easily overcome the Kalam-style cosmological arguments, even if you grant that the universe has a beginning. This is contrary to the expectation of scientific materialists who long portrayed the universe as eternal and self-existent. Yeah, but so did most theists. People like Sir Isaac Newton. People like ma many of these greatest theist scientists that you were talking about formed the basis of modern science because of their Judeo-Christian values earlier in this video believed that the universe was an eternal thing that was co-extended with God and perpetually sustained by him. So the universe being eternal also seems to be a thing that is perfectly expected under theism. Now, I think I could grant just an arguendo that it is more expected under naturalism than not, but I would also argue that time being tenseless, which it has been established, is much more expected under a naturalist perspective than a theist perspective, because this essentially means that there wasn't ever a point at which the universe begins to exist, even if it had a beginning, because there are ontic connotations to the former that are not present in the latter. And that also would be expected under naturalism rather than theism. So you're not making the point that you think you're making here, Stephen. I'm sorry. And therefore, in no need of an external creator. This evidence for a beginning has instead confirmed the expectation of theists. Nobel laureate Arno Penzias helped make a key discovery establishing a cosmic beginning. Except that the cosmic microwave background does not establish a cosmic beginning. It establishes, establishes that there was, very early in the universe's evolution, a very, very hot phase from which it evolved. He later observed, the best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted. 
had I nothing to go on but the first five books of Moses and the Bible as a whole. And this is another quote mine. This is his personal opinion. Just because it's a scientist saying it doesn't mean that this is a science-based opinion. This is his opinion. He would have personally thought the same thing if he had just the first five books of Moses and the Bible as a whole to go off of. But I can tell you the vast majority of scientists would say the exact opposite. So again, we see more quote minds because that's all that the intelligent design conspiracists seem to have. And he they can't quote the scientists on the actual science because the actual science doesn't support their position. He's not alone. Cosmological evidence has led other prominent scientists including former MIT physicist Gerald Schroeder and the great Caltech astronomer Alan Sandage to affirm a transcendent creator beyond space and time as the best explanation for the origin of our finite universe. Argument from authority. Just because two people who were great scientists said that they believe in a transcendent creator that exists beyond space and time is the best explanation for the origin of our finite universe does not mean that that even has any meaningful merit to it. Fallacy after fallacy after fallacy. What more would I expect from fucking Prager University? Second, fine tuning. We live in what Australian physicist Luke Barnes called who is a Christian theist and has pushed the fine-tuning argument, but has only ever argued. His argument essentially doesn't go any further than the parameters, the most fundamental parameters that the universe is based on are extraordinarily highly constrained with the values that they have. Life can arise as a result of those values being highly constrained. But making the jump that thereby it was constrained by something that had the intent for constraining it with life as the outcome of that, th those parameters being constrained is a jump that I've seen him try to make, but has never really fully established. Not to mention, we haven't established that the universe is finely tuned. We need to hash out what we mean by that phrase and how we can go about showing that it does apply to the universe. Now, there are ways that we can do that, but when we do that, the term fine tuning becomes more of a misnomer, kind of like the term big bang, where the big bang wasn't big and there wasn't a bang, but that was just a term that was slapped on it and the scientists ran with it. That's what fine tuning sort of means amongst the physicists. Not that there was something that tuned this thing finely for some intended goal or outcome, but that's just a term that physicists use to describe the fact that many of these constants and parameters are highly constrained, and at least currently, we don't know why. Calls an extremely fortunate universe where fundamental laws and physical parameters have somehow been fine tuned with just the right strengths and values to make life possible. And again, this presupposes that life has some form of privileged frame of reference. Why should we think that? What if the universe was finely tuned, but it was actually against life, yet somehow life arose anyway? This is another problem with the fine-tuning argument. They're looking at the way reality is and trying to derive from that the way God ought the world to be, i.e., he wants life to exist in it. Well, that's a big problem for anybody that takes seriously Hume's is ought distinction. You're never going to be able to look at the way the universe is and determine from that the way it ought be or the way that God, even if we granted that he existed, ought the universe to be. You're never going to be able to do it. You're supposing that life is the intended outcome and that the universe was structured such that it would arise before you've demonstrated that, which is why you're begging the question. The incredible odds against this happening by chance has led even agnostic and atheistic physicists to marvel. As British physicist Paul Davies has exclaimed, the impression... Wait, isn't Paul Davies a Christian, though? Maybe he's not. I thought he was. Don't quote me on that. I could have sworn I, th I thought that he was like a theist of some sort. You know what? You know... This keyboard could ever work properly. God, I hate MacBook keyboards so much. Keys are shit. They don't go down far enough. Alrighty, let's see. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I'm not seeing anything immediately saying that he is, in fact, a Christian or anything. I thought he was. Maybe not a Christian, but I thought he was a theist. 
Hold on here. What do we have? You take this and degenerate the state series of faith sex stuff. Well, okay, a 2007 opinion piece, Taking Science on Faith in the New York Times, generated controversy over its exploration of the role of faith in scientific inquiry. Davies argued that the faith scientists have in the immutability of physical laws has its origins in Christian theology, and that the claim that science is free of faith is manifestly bogus. While atheists Richard Dawkins and Victor J. Stenger have criticized Davies' public stance on science and religion, others, including the John Templeton Foundation, have praised his work. So I guess I can't say that he is a theist, but he is certainly very, very amicable to the ideas of, you know, intelligent design as far as I know. Um, but I, I guess I can't say that he is a theist. The of design is overwhelming. Atheist physicist George Greenstein expresses similar cognitive dissonance. The thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency must be involved. Third, by the way, these are just more quote mind state. They really don't mean anything. The complexity of life. And this doesn't work because as we've shown, complexity is not a feature of design. Physical attributes of something are not what we infer design from. So to look at the physical attributes of something and say that it's designed isn't going to get you there. Molecular biology has revealed the presence in living cells of an exquisite world of informational nanotechnology. Digital code in DNA and RNA. It's code, but it's not digital code. DNA, tiny, intricately constructed molecular machines a complex information storage, transmission, and processing system that resembles but vastly exceeds our most advanced digital high technology. I, I have heard from a lot of people in the, the realm of computer science that say the idea that DNA is like vastly beyond what we can do actually isn't true. That DNA is extraordinarily complex, has things in it you would not want in a code, is way, way too bulky and unwieldy, that it's got a bunch of redundancies. But if you wanted to look at it as a code, I have heard that it would be an absolutely horrendous code and that anybody who had any real intelligence would not have designed it to look like that. But I don't know shit about the computer science and stuff, so I, I can only reiterate what they're saying. That doesn't actually mean that they're correct, but that, that is what I have been told by people who, well, did such things as literally help pioneer the, the internet. So I think that I can trust what they have to say. Not what anyone would expect to see as the result of blind materialistic processes. Dawkins himself may have conceded as much when he recently confessed to being knocked sideways with wonder at the miniaturized intricacy of the data processing machinery in the living cell. So what should we make of all this? For their part, reality is complex and it operates in strange ways. Scientific atheists have constructed ever more convoluted and fanciful theories. They posit a- Except that they haven't. The only people that are positing a convoluted wannabe theory are intelligent design conspiracists who aren't being taken seriously by the actual theorists. Alien designers to account for the alien designers is not something that's legitimate or that has really legitimately been considered by origins of life researchers. Code of life, multiple parallel universe, uh, the parallel universes, and you know, multi multi multiverse theories have n have been considered, but have never been like mainstream cosmology. So again, these aren't like actually meaningful theories that scientists have been have been putting out there. They're like f rather fringe, maybe somewhat reasonable, but still somewhat fringe ideas that most professionals are like, nah, that's probably not the case. Versus to try to explain fine tuning. And they've developed elaborate mathematical equations in an attempt to use physics to show how the universe could have begun from nothing physical. Um, well, with respect to some of those, most of them don't work because we don't have we don't have any knowledge of the earliest moments of the universe. Most physicists aren't going to say that the universe comes from anything at all let alone that it comes from nothing. The universe doesn't do a come from. It's not a thing that it does. But what if the scientific atheists are just wrong? 
What if the UN... Well, if they were wrong, I think that there would probably be much more substantial evidence in favor of atheism being wrong. Look, I got to be honest. I, I don't think that atheism and more broadly naturalism is really all that far-fetched. In fact, I think it's significantly less far-fetched, more parsimonious, has a significantly higher prior probability, and is much more coherent than theism broadly. The universe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is an intelligent and purposeful creator behind it all. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. In my book, Return of the God Hypothesis, I argue that the universe and has here we precisely go to such properties. And that raises a hopeful possibility that we are not the product of blind, pitiless indifference, but instead that we not. were made on purpose, that we were intended. British historian Paul Johnson has there. argued that the existence or non-existence of God is the most important question we humans can ever ask. One of the most important questions. One of. Given the scientific evidence we now have, it might be time to consider or reconsider this question. I'm Stephen Meyer, philosopher of science at the Discovery Institute right. for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. Alrighty. So there, that was the video. Um, I have to be honest. I, I should have not expected as much as I was going to because it's Prager U. Um, they really did some weird stuff. The blurriness is way blurrier and it's not nearly as stable as he is. Anyway, um, I was it, not because it was coming from Prager U, but because they had Steven Meyer in it. I was expecting actually a little bit more substance in it than it had. I didn't think that video had really much substance to it at all. William Lane Craig's like he's got like four videos out there one on the leibnizian contingency argument one on the kalam cosmological argument one on the moral or, or the fine-tuning argument one on the moral argument one on the ontological argument so five put together they're all about as long as this video was and they are significantly more substantive than this video could have ever hoped to be he's a philosopher of science and this was the best defense in 30 minutes roughly that he could come up with for intelligent design this was it i'm 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 genuinely blown away but again it's prager you you know given their audience you know you can't really have the complex philosophy and metaphysics and stuff like that and it you'll lose them way too quickly um but yeah i i actually was expecting quite a bit more out of that video than than what we saw um there really wasn't much substantively to respond to um which is why i actually don't this is i think my first prager you video that i've done this is usually why i don't review their videos because there's not much substance to them at all but hopefully you guys enjoyed hanging out here with me for a good hour and a half on a on a monday evening i certainly had fun you know poking at prager you and the the absolute how asinine their videos are. I do want to say though, Stephen Meyer has always been one of the intelligent design conspiracists. I would have, I would just love to have a debate on just because. Well, I'm going to be honest. He's one of the more popular ones out there, and I just think it would be interesting to have a discussion. You're a philosopher of science. I'm not, but I like philosophy of science. Let's have a discussion on naturalism versus intelligent design. Let's really break in and see which one is more parsimonious um not that he'll ever watch my videos and i doubt that if he ever saw this um that he would ever agree but if he happens to see this or if anybody actually knows how to get in contact with him and wants to let him know i am more than willing there are numerous very very fair moderated platforms we could have a discussion on doesn't even have to be a formal debate um the non sequitur show is up and running again so we, we could have a discussion on there but i would I almost want to say I'm formally calling him out, but I'm just, I'm not a large enough content creator to want to do stuff like that because nobody watches my content other than like, you know, the people that are close to me in the community, which is fine. I do this for me and for you guys. I don't do this for like, well, I mean, if millions of people were watching my videos, that would be cool, but they're not. So I mean, I'm doing it for the people that enjoy my content as well as myself, because I like being able to talk about these things. But yeah, I, Stephen Meyer, I would say out of all the people you know, the Stephen Myers, the Nathaniel Jensen's, the Michael Behe's, the John Sanford's, out of all of those kinds of intelligent design creationism people, Stephen Myers, the one that 
honestly, I would say I probably have the most respect for and have wanted to talk to the most other than maybe Jason Lyle because he does specifically astrophysics, which is my area of interest. But with, with that, I'm going to let you guys know and enjoy the rest. Let you guys go, not let you guys know. Let you guys go and enjoy the rest of your Monday evening and the rest of your weeks, the rest of your week. And I might do a stream later this week. I don't know yet. Um, there's some articles I'm thinking about maybe doing a review on here. I don't know yet. Some of them aren't very long. I don't know how much substance I'm going to get out of them. And I don't want to do something that's going to be kind of just quick and boring. That's not it's not what I'm in. But as always, you know, per calcem nos perfectum, because I love Latin, um, even though I can't really speak it. Um, through reason, we progress, not through wild conspiracies. Y'all have a good night.